See, people today are looking for an easy, lazy, convenient, popular way to serve Jesus. It doesn't work that way. You know why? That's, why? that's why Jesus said, if you're thinking about being one of my followers, he said, count the cost. Listen, think about it. Count the cost before you decide to do this because there's going to be consequences. Your faith will get you in trouble. Count the cost before becoming a disciple of mine. Second Timothy. Powerful name it is. We'll be talking about that this morning. If you have your Bibles, would you be finding Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 7, and then also uh, Hebrews 11. If you want to put your little Bible ribbon in Hebrews 11 or take your, if you didn't use your visitor slip, just rip that off your bulletin. Maybe slip it there at Hebrews chapter 11. We'll be there in just a little bit, maybe toward the end when you're tired and you're not going to feel like turning, so go ahead and turn right now, okay? <laughs> All right, well, if you're visiting, man, we've been making our way through the book of Acts, and we started in chapter 1, verse 1, and we, uh, last week we finished up chapter 6, verse 7, and so we're going to pick up, really, where we left off uh, last week. Now, if you're a Christian here today, there have been times in your life when you have been prompted to stand up for Jesus. The Holy Spirit within you convicted you, prodded you to stand up for Jesus. It may have been at the office. It may have been at the school. It may have been at the university. It may have been with family. It may have been with some neighbors. But he pricked your heart, convicted you to stand up for him. My question is, did you do that? You know, we're living in a world that is ever-increasingly anti-God, anti-Scripture, anti-biblical principles. I was never made more aware of this than when I went to college. But you see, I was, the school, the high school I went to was a Christian school. And so we had chapel. I don't know if it was every day, but it was every week. We certainly did. And, and so I, that's where I was. And uh, my, my parents made that choice, didn't want to bust me an hour away and then an hour back at the end of the day. And so they said, we're not going to do it. And so they started some Christian schools, and that's where we were. But the first time I went to college, man, I walked into that classroom for the very first time. A professor, man, didn't believe in God. As a matter of fact, he, he, he was a, he'd be an atheist. She would be an atheist. And, and not only didn't believe, but said things that were derogatory and defaming to God about God. And uh, I'll never forget being in a sociology class in, in Memphis, University of Memphis. And I, I walked into that class, and, and of course, this, this happened in psychology, it happened in my philosophy class, and then so, sociology. You're talking about society, you know, and sociology. And I remember us talking about marriage, we were talking about um, uh, sexual mores, that is, different beliefs about sexuality and those kinds of things, and... and um, people's lifestyles and that kind of stuff. And, and um, the professor said something like this. He said, you know, the, the Bible and our traditions and the, the way we've done it in the past, it's, it's, it's old-fashioned. It's out of date. And we've been talking about this for several weeks. And I'll have to admit, I'm a little bit ashamed to admit it, but my, my, my plan was when I went into that class and I heard all these things, and of course this was later on. This was, I don't know, I was a junior probably. And so I'd heard many of these things, but my, my objective was to lay low, pass the test, and move on to something else. Well, the, this profe- he, just loved inter- he just loved interaction. He wanted people to talk, and that was part of your grade. Participation was one of your things you were graded on. And so we were talking about these things one day, and, or they were, and, and he, he, I don't know if he knew, hey, he, he hasn't spoken, he hasn't said anything, but for whatever reason, I don't even think he knew my name, he just pointed up and said, what do you think? And at that moment, I mean, I'm sure you've had it too. At that moment, boom, the Holy Spirit convicted me, prompted me 
to take a stand, to stand up for Jesus. And so we were talking about all these things, marriage, sexual lifestyles, and so on and so forth. And I just said, I don't remember exactly, but it was something like this. I said, well, the Bible says that uh, premarital sex is wrong. People were talking, they were talking about living with each other. And I said, well, the Bible says that's wrong. We talked about lifestyles, that men now are living with men and women with women. I said, well, the Bible says that's wrong. I said, it's just, it's just not right. D- divorce. You know, the sanctity of marriage is just thrown away like a wadded up newspaper. And I said, that's not, that was never God's intention. He hates it. In fact, in fact, that's what the scripture says. He hates it. I can tell you that, that just went over peachy. <laughs> it went over like a lead balloon. In fact, I, I've never seen so much participation Hands started going up, and people started interrupting each other, and they were, they were talking over one another and back and forth. And I'll never forget this, this young lady sitting right in front of me, turned around, and I mean spewed venom. I mean, she spit on me, not intentionally, but just, just speaking so loud and so fast, and her face was blood red. I thought she was going to pop. And if there was anyone who stood with me that day, I do not remember it, and I think I would have. You ever felt that way? Maybe at your work. Maybe at your school. Maybe at your university. We're going to be called on to stand up for Jesus as believers. It's just going to happen in this life. And I was wondering, I want to ask you this question. What is the worst thing that can happen to you when you stand up for Jesus? You say, well, they could laugh at me. Yes, they could. But I don't think that's the worst thing they could do. So well, they might mock me. Yes, they may very well mock you, but that's not the worst thing they can do. You say, well, if it's at work and they've, they've told us not to do that kind of a thing, I'm, they may report me. Yes, They might even terminate me. They might fire me. They could, but that's not the worst thing they could do. See, well, they might spit at me. Yes, they could. They might even beat you up, but that's not the worst thing they could do. The worst thing they could do is they could kill you. You remember this girl? Look at this girl. This is Cassie Bernal. Remember her? High school student. Columbine, uh, Columbine High School there in Colorado. She was asked, do you believe in God with a gun pointed right at her head? And the Holy Spirit prompted her to stand up for Jesus. And she said, yes, I do believe in God. And the trigger was pulled. The, the thing we need to remember when we're asked to stand up for Jesus Matthew 10, verse 28, Jesus put it this way. Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Don't fear anyone who can take your life. As a matter of fact, I said that's the worst thing that can happen, but really all it does for the child of God is usher us into the presence of the Lord that much quicker. I want to talk about a man who stood up for the Lord Jesus. He's very familiar to us, most of us who've read our Bibles, Stephen. He's actually the, the, the New Testament church's first martyr. The first martyr. And I want to see some things in his life. And I, I hope we'll learn some principles that, that he had that will apply to us and that we can take hold of today because here's what i want you to remember we talked about this a few months ago second timothy 3 verse 12 all not some not even most all who desire to live godly in christ jesus will be not could be or might be will be pursued persecuted mocked laughed at whatever the the persecution might be it will happen okay so how do we persevere through the persecution well i want to give you the message is just a little bit different. I'm going to give you a really, I hope, a really quick outline, three things, and then I want to come back and apply and make some points of application. I think, I hope that'll help us all stand up for Jesus at the end, okay? So let me just give you a very quick out. Number one, what, the first thing we need to do is remember the help from God's Spirit. Remember the help that comes from God's Spirit. Now, follow along with me as I read now in Acts chapter 6, 
Picking up in verse 8 where we left off last week. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. But some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both uh, the Cyrenians and the Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and argued with Stephen. But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came up to him, and they dragged him away and brought him before the council. They put forward false witnesses who said, This man incessantly speaks against this holy place, that is, the temple and the law. For we have heard him say that this Nazarene Jesus will destroy this place and alter the customs which Moses handed down to us. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. The first thing I think we want to ask, if we're really honest, is who in the world is Stephen? Because we've never heard anything about him really up until this time. Well, Stephen is a deacon. <laughs> He's a deacon. Remember we talked about deacons last week and the establishment of the office of deacon and the ministry of a deacon and so on and so forth. Look back, if you will, in chapter 6 and verse 3. They had this problem about service and all this kind of things where people were being neglected and so forth. And we, we talked about that last week. But then in verse 3, it says, to, to solve this problem of ministry... Select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, that we can put in charge of this task. Look about the middle of verse 5. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. So Stephen was a deacon. And, and the, what I want you to understand is he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And we're going to talk about that application in just a moment, okay? Well, in just a little bit. So I'm not going to get into that right now. But what I want you to see and understand is this. The same Holy Spirit that was in Stephen that enabled him to stand up for Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that is in you and me, those of us who follow Jesus Christ and have surrendered to Him. It's, it's the same Holy Spirit. He is the Spirit who helps us witness he is the one who gives us courage. And hey, by the way, the Holy Spirit's ministry is to help us. Remember, He is the help. Jesus, I'll give you a helper. Hey, guess what? Not only will He help you witness, He'll help you overcome your addictions. He'll help you in your temptations. The Holy Spirit, He'll, he'll, he'll help you become a better spouse. He'll help you become a better a parent. He'll help you become a better Christian. He's our helper. And so never forget and or, or underestimate the help of the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing. Number two, not only remember the help from God's Spirit, but remember the history from God's Scripture. Now, Stephen is being accused of some things. And just like they did with Jesus, remember what they did with, they stirred up some people to come and tell lies. And, and the accusations, a lot of times accusations are they'll take a tidbit of truth and then throw in a bunch of stuff that was made up. Okay, and they were accusing him. Yeah, he had talked about Moses. Yes, maybe he had talked about the temple. But what they were doing is they were lying. They were called upon, just like they did with Jesus. Come in and, and tell some lies and let's stir up some stuff so we can take this guy before the religious leaders and we'll, we'll get this problem solved. And so that's what they did. They said he's talking against Moses. He's talking against God. He's talking against the temple. And so notice what happens in chapter 7 and verse 1. The high priest said, are these things so? So they bring Stephen in before the religious leaders and they say, hey, listen, people are saying you're doing this and all, the, all these people stand up, these witnesses stand up and bear false testimony and so on and so forth. And so the, the, the high priest says, are these things so? As a result of that question, what happens in the next 59 verses is, is Stephen gives really a sermon. It's his defense, but it's a sermon from the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, it's the longest sermon in the book of Acts. And I want to I go on record as saying, notice that the longest sermon in the book of Acts comes not from a preacher, but from a deacon. 
Don't forget that. <laughs> so next time you're getting on to me, I want you to go look at one of these deacons that are running around here. So anyway, so he, he gives this sermon. He gives this long thing. And here's the way he divides it up. He, he takes five people and he just, he gives a synopsis of the Old Testament. You remember Cliff Notes? I mean, when I was in college, I used Cliff Notes a lot. Probably shouldn't say that, but, you know, it would take a big old long play like Julius Caesar. It might take you a month to read it and all those ways. We didn't talk like that. In, in that kind. So it might take a month to read it. Well, Cliff Notes would narrow it down and take you only about 20 minutes and you could pass the test. Now, kids, I don't recommend it, even though I did it. Do what I say and not what I did. So, Anyway, so it, he just takes the whole Old Testament and he condenses it down to about what we would call 59 verses, okay? And, and listen, I wish we had time because there's, a, there's several sermons within it. These could be these four things I'm going to share with you. They could be four sermons for sure. But I, I think we'd miss the context and miss the, what, what I think we're supposed to do today. And so what I'm going to do, I really had some things down here that I wanted to share, share about each one of these things, but I'm not going to do it. Just for the sake of time, I'm going to list for you these four things. He, 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 he summarizes the entire Old Testament around four or five people, okay? And the whole thing about the, the Old Testament is that it points us to the gospel. That's really what the Old Testament is. And so it's pointing us to the gospel message, and that's what we see in these verses. So let me just give you these four, these four or five people and what I think what is being represented. Number one, Abraham. He starts, Stephen starts his sermon, he starts his defense, and he talks about Abraham. And you might write out beside Abraham's name this, God initiates a relationship with us by faith, okay? That's what happens with, with Abraham. In verse 1, he says, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham. Now you can go home and you can read about what he says about Abraham, but the whole thing about Abraham, the father of our faith, is this. God initiates, he's the one who started a relationship with us, who wants to have a relationship with us, and he says it's going to be by faith. Abraham was looking for a city not made with hands. He was marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion, the beautiful city of God. And so God initiated a relationship with us, okay? So we could talk a lot more about that, have another whole sermon, but let's move to the number two. Number two is Joseph. In about verse 9, he picks up and he starts talking about Joseph. And here's what I would say about Joseph, what we learn about him. God's peace, God's provision, and God's power. God's peace in that, listen, you remember all the negative things that happened to Joseph. He was sold by his brothers. He was, a, he was in prison in Egypt. And all these negative things we don't have time to go into. But through it all, he had a peace that he was in God's hands. And God was going to work it out. And then talk about provisions. God provides to us, and he used Joseph to provide for the Egyptians, but also to the Hebrews. All those people came to, all, the, all of his family came to Egypt, and he provided for them through God's mighty power. Okay, so that was Joseph. But then he talks about Moses. Because remember, with all those people in, in Egypt, Pharaoh turned them into slaves, all the Hebrews. Remember that? You remember the story? And so uh, Pharaoh turns them all into slaves, and God raises up a deliverer. His name is Moses, okay? And the thing about Moses is Moses is a picture of Christ. And Stephen points that out. This is important. So look down, if you will, at verse 37. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about the Messiah. God's going to raise up a deliverer. I'm just a picture of that deliverer. But here's what happened to Moses, and here's what happened to Christ. Look at verse 38. And this is the one who was in the congregation of the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai, and who was with our fathers and received the living oracles passed down to you. Now, who, what is he talking about? He's talking about the Ten Commandments. Moses received the Ten Commandments. Look in verse 39. And here's the thing. Our fathers were unwilling to be obedient to him, but repudiated him in their hearts, and they turned back to Egypt. And here again, Moses is a picture of the deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ, who the Messiah that God would send, but he would be rejected by this world. Just like Moses was rejected. And people turned back to Egypt and they turned their hearts away from God. And that's the picture that Stephen paints, okay? But then he talks about David and Solomon. And on this, he's just really talking about a temple and properly understanding what the temple is all about, okay? Uh, what Stephen says to these guys, and, and that they were big on the temple now, but Stephen says to them, God does not dwell in temples made by human hands. That's, that's, not, that's not what it's about. Look in verse 46. 
David found favor in God's sight and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. In other words, David wanted to build a temple, but God said, no, you're a man of war. You cannot do it. Verse 47, but it was Solomon, his son, who built a house for God. However, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands. That was Stephen's point. He said, I want you to understand. Yes, we have a wonderful temple here, but God does not dwell in, in houses made by human hands, but hearts made from the hand of God. That's what Stephen was saying. Okay, that, that was his point. All right. Now, so let's sum this up. What, what's happened in these 50 some odd verses? He's condensed the Old Testament down, and here's, if we could put it in one sentence or one statement, I would say it this way. God pursued a relationship with man by faith. He wants to give man peace, provisions, and power, and he'll do it through a deliverer whom God will send to live not in a house but in our hearts. And I would even, you could add this, that the world rejects, okay? That's what Stephen has talked about, okay? So everything's going pretty good up until this point. He preaches his sermon. He makes his defense. Everything's going pretty good until Stephen looks at those religious leaders, points his finger. I don't know if he pointed his finger, but he said, you have rejected God every step of the way. Look at verse 51. You men, you are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, and you're always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you did not keep it. Okay, he's, he's calling them to task, and that leads us to the third part of this simple outline. Remember the help from God's Spirit, the history from God's Scripture, and now the home from, for God's saints. The home for God's saints. Stephen is pointing to, out to them that the very ones who persecuted Abraham, Joseph, Moses, all those are the very same ones who are now persecuting him. He's saying, you're no different. You're just like them. You're doing exactly what they did. I mean, and everything was going pretty good until he says, he comes up and he says, oh, oh, by the way, I'm talking about you. You're the ones who have rejected the Messiah. As a matter, and they didn't like that. Man, number one, they didn't like the, the fact that he was telling them you have missed the Messiah, but he doesn't just leave it there. He's saying not only did you miss the Messiah and reject the Messiah, you have murdered the Messiah. You have killed the Messiah. That's what he says. You're, a mur you're, 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 you're murderers and so on and so forth. Look at what he says in verse 54. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick. You know, the Bible says the Scripture is like a two-edged sword. Cut to the quick. There's two edges to a sword. You could say it one simple as this. One, one side cuts with conviction and leads to repentance. Another side will condemn those who reject the truth. And that's what we're seeing right here. There was, there was not conviction that led to repentance. There was condemnation because of their rejection. That's, they were cut to the quick. They began gnashing their teeth. They were just, we want to kill this guy. We don't like what he's saying. But being, full, listen, but being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Stephen actually sees heaven. He looks up and God opens a window. God open, lets the drape up, the shade up. And he sees into heaven the glory, the majesty of heaven. And he sees Jesus standing up. Remember that song they used to sing that was so popular not long ago? I can only imagine. Remember that? That's not what this is. This is not imagination. This is the real deal. This is reality. He was seeing it. Only five people from earth saw heaven. Only five. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Paul, John, and now Stephen. 
And so he sees it. And look, then he says that, and then look what happens in verse 57. And they cried out with a loud voice, and they covered their ears, and they rushed at him with one impulse. And when they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him. And the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. That's very, very important. We're going to read about Saul, who is actually Paul. And, and we're going to see that this incident in Paul's life never left him. He never forgot what happened to Stephen. He ne- it, I'm telling you, it impacted him from this day forward, okay? So, that's, that's Paul. Look at verse 59. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord, and he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Does that sound familiar? Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, and he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep, which is the Bible's way of saying a Christian has died. Now, tradition holds, and I've been to Israel a couple of times, and I've seen this. You walk around, there's rocks everywhere, and there's, there are, there's, history holds that he was pushed off a precipice, and they were everywhere. I mean, you had to crawl everywhere, climb everywhere, and you have little paths up, and you go up a little high, you come back down, you go up and around, there's rocks everywhere. And so he was up on a, pe- a precipice, and they pushed him down, and then, and rocks were everywhere, and they are still everywhere. And so they were picking those rocks up, and they were throwing them down. They were throwing them down at him, and they stoned him. But Stephen, as he was being stoned, he said almost identically what the Lord said at the cross. He said, Father, forgive them. Don't hold this against them. They don't know what they're doing. And he said, receive my spirit, just like the Lord Jesus said from the cross. And so, I think it's interesting in verse 56, when he looks up and he sees Jesus standing. Now listen, anytime, most of the time in the Bible when we see Jesus, a picture of heaven, it's referred to him as seated at the right hand of the Father, right? He is seated. Why is he standing? Well, he's standing to re- receive one of his saints. He's standing to receive one of his children. Somebody has said, if you'll stand for Jesus, he'll stand for you. I like that. So how do we stand for him? How do we stand up for Jesus when when we are prompted by the Holy Spirit? Where do we find the boldness and the courage? This is the point I want to make. These are the points. This is the application I want to bring this thing home with, okay? Stephen was full of four things. You know, you've heard somebody say, man, he's just full of it. (laughs) Well... Stephen was full of what we need to be filled with, okay? And so I want you to notice four things Stephen was full of. Number one, he was full of wisdom to speak for Christ. He was full of wisdom. Look, if you will, in chapter 6. Go back now to chapter 6 and look in verse 10. When he was brought, when he started saying these things, he was doing these great things, and the people came back against him, and, and they start arguing with him, and people start making accusations. And look at verse 10. But they were unable to cope, now look at this, with the wisdom that the Spirit gave him. The Spirit gave him wisdom, okay? And so he was full of wisdom to speak for Christ. So many times we get worried. We, we know we're going to go to work and we're going to face that group over there who's going to talk to me about my faith and against my faith with those people at the, at the school over here or maybe just like I uh, described a moment ago, that university professor is going to be that way. And we go there and we think, what am I going to say? And I don't even want It's just like me. Man, I was just trying to get through it. I, I dreaded going to class. There were so many classes. I just dreaded going because I knew what it was going to be. And so what do we do? We we sit there and we think, and what are we going to say? We practice what we're going to say. We we work up our arguments. And and, and Jesus said, don't do that. Don't do that. Listen to this. Luke 21, verse 12. But before all this occurs, there will be a time of great persecution. You will be dragged into synagogues and prisons, and you will stand trial before kings and governors. Listen, for the only reason of being my followers... Just simply because you're my follower, you're going to be persecuted. But this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. So don't worry in advance about how to answer the charges, okay? Don't worry about that. For I will give you the right words, now here it is, and such wisdom, wisdom, that none of your opponents will be able to reply or to refute you, and that's exactly what's happening in verse 10. They were unable to do it because of the wisdom he spoke with. God gives us wisdom to speak for Christ through His Holy Spirit. Number two, not only was He full of wisdom to speak for Christ, He was full of grace to shine for Christ. He was full of grace to shine 
for Christ. Now, look, at, look if you will, at verse 8. And Stephen, full of grace. Just stop right there. He's full of grace. Verse 10 says, He spoke with wisdom and the Spirit. And the Spirit. It's important to see that as Stephen stood for the Lord Jesus, he did it with grace. Man, when they were throwing rocks at him, he didn't throw rocks back at them. I think that's interesting. See, so many times, they, they gnashed their teeth. And, it says they were gnashing. They were just, uh, uh, get this guy. But that's, he smiled back at them. See, so many times, listen, we fight in the flesh. Now listen, I understand about righteous, righteous indignation. Some of these things that go on in our country and going in our world, it makes me angry. I'm telling you, it makes me angry. But listen, we're not to fight in the flesh. We're to fight with grace. See, so many times we get angry. You get angry at that person at work, that angry at that person at school, or, or, or maybe on fake book. You know, you get, man, there's so many things that stir everybody in the world and their brother up on fake book. And so what do we do? Man, we, we fight in anger. We fight in the flesh. And we act like the world. We talk like the world. We, we shout like the world. We cuss like the world. And we, what have we done? We failed to let our light shine. We failed to let the grace of God season our speech. But yet, Stephen, that's exactly what he did. The light of Christ is shining through him. And let me just give you a couple. Of, in, in Acts chapter 6, verse 15, it says he had the face of an angel. Now, I don't know what that face looks like, but I don't know what, I'll tell you this. It sounds a lot like grace. The face of an angel. And, and si Acts 6, verse 10 says he spoke with the Spirit. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 1, he calls them brethren and fathers. I think that's significant. In other words, he was treating these guys who were disrespecting him with great respect. He called them brethren. He called them fathers. Sounds like grace. Acts 7, verse 60. The scripture says he prayed that God would not hold this sin against them. After they were just pelting him with stones, he was saying, Father, don't hold it against them. Forgive them. Man, I'll tell you what, that sounds a lot like grace. Amen. God's spirit within us will give us wisdom to speak for Christ. He'll give us grace to to shine for Christ. But number three, he was full of power to stand for Christ. Power. Look in verse 8 again. And Stephen full of grace and what? And power. Only power is going to give us the courage and the boldness to stand up for Jesus. He had power. Do you remember Peter? On the night Jesus was betrayed, it says he denied him not just once, not twice, but three times he denied Jesus. Three times. But then we see him in the book of Acts as a bold soldier for the Lord Jesus. What made the difference? Acts 1.8. He says, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The Holy Spirit came upon Peter, and man, he was a courageous leader. That's what happens. He says, I'm going to give you my power. And I, and I, told you, I said it a minute ago. The same Spirit that was in Peter, the same Spirit that was in Stephen, is the same Spirit in you and I as believers. So you're going to have times when you go to your work, when you go to your office, when you go to your plant, when you go to your school, and, and the Holy Spirit's going to prompt you to stand up for Jesus. And here's what you need to remember. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7. God has not given you a spirit of fear. Now, if you have fear, that didn't come from God. He's not given us a spirit of fear or timidity, but one of power, love, and self-discipline. Power. He said, I've given you power to be my witnesses. Ephesians 6 verse 13. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day having done everything. Look at this. To stand, to stand firm for the Lord Jesus. Adrian Rogers, I like what he said. He put it this way. He said, a man is not, real, not ready to really live until he's first ready to die. You're not ready to live, really, until you're ready to die. If you kneel before God, you'll have power to stand before any man. And I would say amen. Now the last thing. How did he stand? Well, he was full of wisdom to speak for Christ. He was full of grace to shine for Christ. He was full of power to stand for Christ. And he was full of faith 
to suffer for Christ. Now, verse 5 of chapter 6 says, They chose Stephen. Look at this, a man full of faith. Full of faith. You know, Stephen could have avoided every bit of this. All he had to do was say what they wanted him to say. Hey, guess what? You can avoid all that rigmarole at your work, at your school. I could have avoided all that stuff in college. Wouldn't have had a girl spit in my face. If you just say what they want you to say. Say, say what they want to hear. But it was his faith that made him willing to suffer shame for Jesus' name. Some say our faith will get us out of trouble. Oh, no, dear friend. Your faith is going to get you in trouble. Do you hear me? Well, your faith will get you out of trouble. No, your faith will get you into trouble. Adrian Rogers again. He said, Jesus didn't come to get you out of trouble. He came to get into trouble with you. He came to get into trouble with you. Faith will not keep you from suffering. It will enable you to suffer. What was it in Stephen that gave him the courage to stand up for Jesus and to stand alone? He had to stand alone. I'm going to tell you what, it was faith in another world. It was faith to see another world, an unseen world. Here's a timeless truth I would give you. You'll never be willing to suffer in this world until you by faith see another world. Hear me? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm trying to say right there? You'll, you'll never be willing to suffer. Listen, if, you're, if all you're concerned about is this world and what everybody's saying in this world and all this stuff, you'll never be willing to suffer for the Lord until you see by faith the other world. And I'm talking about God's kingdom. When you see that world, man, you'll, you'll suffer gladly for His name's sake. See, people today are looking for an easy, lazy, convenient, popular way to serve Jesus. It doesn't work that way. You know why? That's, why? that's why Jesus said, if you're thinking about being one of my followers, he said, count the cost. Listen, think about it. Count the cost before you decide to do this because there's going to be consequences. Your faith will get you in trouble. Count the cost before becoming a disciple of mine. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So think about it this way. The great question is not do we have faith to escape. The great question is do we have faith to endure. Not do we have faith to be delivered, but do we have faith to die. Well, we don't want to think about it like that, do we? I'm going to show you that we don't. Turn to Hebrews. We'll be through. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Aren't you glad I had you do that earlier? See, a lot of you already closed up shop. You thought I forgot about it. I didn't. Hebrews 11, you know, now Hebrews 11 is God's hall of faith, okay? These are great men and great women of faith. I mean, these, these are the powerhouses that we'd say, man, I wish I could be like that. Moses and Joshua and all these people. Man, I wish I had the faith that they had and so on and so forth. Well, look, if you will, at verse 32. He's talked about all these people, many of them. And then, then, then verse 32 says, and what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I, if I talk of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, David and Samuel and the prophets. These guys were great guys because who by faith they conquered kingdoms. And they performed, that's what we want to do, right? We want to conquer a kingdom. Performed acts of righteousness and they obtained promises. Shut the mouths of lions. That's what I want to do, Lord. Man, I want to shut the mouth of a lion. That's what Daniel did. Quench the power of fire, escape the edge of the sword, and, and from weakness were made strong, and they were mighty in war, and they put foreign armies to flight. Lord, that's what I want to do. But now wait a minute. Wait a minute. We need to keep reading. Look at verse 35. And others who were, look at this, tortured. Well, now wait a minute. I don't want that part of it. Not accepting their release. In other words, they could have, they could have said what was wanted, they wanted to hear so that they could have been... No, they didn't do that. So they might obtain a better resurrection. Others experienced, look at this, mockings and scourgings and yes, chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. Many of them were stoned. They, look, they were sawn in two. Boy, I don't, what about that one? No, I, 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 want the, I want to shut the mouth of a lion. I'd rather do that. They were tempted. They were put to death with the sword. 
And look at this, they went about in this life in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute and afflicted and ill-treated. Men whom this world was not worthy. They wandered around in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. So we say, man, I just want an easy way to serve Him. I'm going to tell you, the Christian life, it's not all kisses and sugar and sweetness and peaches. It's just not. And so we have to ask, are we willing to stand up for Jesus? Faith, timeless truth, faith is not primarily receiving from God what you want. Those people who receive those things, that's not what they wanted. But it is accepting from God what he gives. Isaac Watts put it, I think, very poetically and very beautifully. He said, Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease, while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas? No, I must fight if I would reign. Increase my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the shame, supported by thy word. Stand up for Jesus. We've all, listen, could you not say we've all had that experience? Maybe it's at your work, maybe it's at your school, maybe it's with your family, but the Holy Spirit has pricked your heart to stand up for Jesus. Amen. Has it happened to you? Did you stand? I want to close this message. I don't usually close a message like this, but I, I'm thinking about I couldn't think of a better way to do it. Pat, put that first screen up there. Stand up for Jesus. You know, this is a song we don't sing it much anymore, but it talks about standing up for Christ. And we're going to sing it. And I want us to, as you do it, I want you to notice the words. Because it talks about how if you try to do it in the flesh, the arm of flesh is going to fail you. It talks about, listen, this battle in this world, it's short-lived, but the victory is going to be for eternity. It talks about putting on God's armor when we go to stand up for Christ. And so I want us to sing it. Would you do it with me? I think you know it. Most all of us know it. Maybe you've forgotten it, but I'll bet it'll come back, okay? And I can't imagine us singing it sitting down. Sitting down for Jesus. No. Let's sing it. And let's sing it loud and proud. And let's, let's sing it as a prayer. And let's sing it with conviction. And let's look at the words and think about them as we sing it, all right? Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead, till every foe is vanquished. And Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for G. Stand in His strength. His strength alone. The arm of flesh. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Dare not trust your own. On the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. Where duty calls or danger, be never lacking there. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. The strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him who overcometh, a crown of life shall be. He with the King of glory shall reign eternally. Lord Jesus, help us when you by your Spirit convict us to stand up 
and there's not one believer, listen, that you don't call to stand up. We, we, we're not in the secret service. We can't do it in the shadows. You've called us to be your warriors. You've called us to be your soldiers. And we do it with love and we do it with grace, but you've pricked our hearts to stand up for you. And I dare say we'll have opportunities this week to stand up for you. May we not do it in the flesh. May we not holler and scream and shout and curse. But may we do it shining the light of Christ with grace. May we do it with the wisdom you give us. May we do it with the power you give us. Oh Lord, help us to stand up for Jesus. Wherever we find ourselves in this dark, dying world, may we shine the light in the love of Christ. Lord, take this now, this invitation time, and may we just take a few moments just to do business with you. And Lord, to say, maybe honestly, I haven't stood up. You've pricked my heart and I've had opportunities, but I've not done it. I didn't have the courage. I didn't have the boldness. I want to surrender to your spirit, Lord. I want to surrender and receive your wisdom and your power and your grace and your love and faith to see the other world. That this battle is not going to be long. The strife will not be long. But eternity is forever and the reward is forever. Lord, give us courage, give us boldness, give us love, give us grace, give us wisdom. And Lord, give us obedience during this invitation time. We now ask it for your honor, for your sake, for your glory, and in your name. Amen. Let's be obedient to the Lord as he leads us. If maybe there's a decision you need to make, if you want to come up here to the altar, you can come do that. If you need to make a public decision for Christ, we'll give you an opportunity as as we sing and as we pray. All right? Thank you.